part one of chapter eleven of the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the picture of dorian gray by oscar wilde chapter eleven part one for years dorian gray could not free himself from the influence of this book or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that he never sought to free himself from it he procured from paris no less than nine large paper copies of the first edition and had them bound in different colours so that they might suit his various moods and the changing fancies of a nature over which he seemed at times to have almost entirely lost control the hero the wonderful young parisian in whom the romantic and the scientific temperaments were so strangely blended became to him a kind of prefiguring type of himself and indeed the whole book seemed to him to contain the story of his own life written before he had lived it in one point he was more fortunate than the novel's fantastic hero he never knew never indeed had any cause to know that somewhat grotesque dread of mirrors and polished metal surfaces and still water which came upon the young parisian so early in his life and was occasioned by the sudden decay of a beauty that had once apparently been so remarkable it was with an almost cruel joy and perhaps in nearly every joy as certainly in every pleasure cruelty has its place that he used to read the latter part of the book with its really tragic if somewhat over-emphasised account of the sorrow and despair of one who had himself lost what in others and the world he had most dearly valued for the wonderful beauty that had so fascinated basil hallward and many others besides him seemed never to leave him even those who had heard the most evil things against him and from time to time strange rumours about his mode of life crept through london and became the chatter of the clubs could not believe anything to his dishonour when they saw him he had always the look of one who had kept himself unspotted from the world men who talked grossly became silent when dorian gray entered the room there was something in the purity of his face that rebuked them his mere presence seemed to recall to them the memory of the innocence that they had tarnished they wondered how one so charming and graceful as he was could have escaped the stain of an age that was at once sordid and sensual often on returning home from one of those mysterious and prolonged absences that gave rise to such strange conjecture among those who were his friends or thought that they were so he himself would creep upstairs to the locked room open the door with the key that never left him now and stand with a mirror in front of the portrait that basil hallward had painted of him looking now at the evil and ageing face on the canvas and now at the fair young face that laughed back at him from the polished glass the very sharpness of the contrast used to quicken his sense of pleasure he grew more and more enamoured of his own beauty more and more interested in the corruption of his own soul he would examine with minute care and sometimes with a monstrous and terrible delight the hideous lines that seared the wrinkling forehead or crawled around the heavy sensual mouth wondering sometimes which were the more horrible 
the signs of sin or the signs of age he would place his white hands beside the coarse bloated hands of the picture and smile he mocked the misshapen body and the failing limbs there were moments indeed at night when lying sleepless in his own delicately scented chamber or in the sordid room of the little ill-famed tavern near the docks which under an assumed name and in disguise it was his habit to frequent he would think of the ruin he had brought upon his soul with a pity that was all the more poignant because it was purely selfish but moments such as these were rare that curiosity about life which lord henry had first stirred in him as they sat together in the garden of their friend seemed to increase with gratification the more he knew the more he desired to know he had mad hungers that grew more ravenous as he fed them yet he was not really reckless at any rate in his relations to society once or twice every month during the winter and on each wednesday evening while the season lasted he would throw open to the world his beautiful house and have the most celebrated musicians of the day to charm his guests with the wonders of their art his little dinners in the settling of which lord henry always assisted him were noted as much for the careful selection and placing of those invited as for the exquisite taste shown in the decoration of the table with its subtle symphonic arrangements of exotic flowers and embroidered cloths and antique plate of gold and silver indeed there were many especially among the very young men who saw or fancied that they saw in dorian gray the true realization of a type of which they had often dreamed in eton or oxford days a type that was to combine something of the real culture of the scholar with all the grace and distinction and perfect manner of a citizen of the world to them he seemed to be of the company of those whom dante describes as having sought to make themselves perfect by the worship of beauty like gautier he was one for whom the visible world existed and certainly to him life itself was the first the greatest of the arts and for it all the other arts seemed to be but a preparation fashion by which what is really fantastic becomes for a moment universal and dandyism which in its own way is an attempt to assert the absolute modernity of beauty had of course their fascination for him his mode of dressing and the particular styles that from time to time he affected had their marked influence on the young exquisites of the mayfair balls and pall mall club windows who copied him in everything that he did and tried to reproduce the accidental charm of his graceful though to him only half serious fopperies for while he was but too ready to accept the position that was almost immediately offered to him on his coming of age and found indeed a subtle pleasure in the thought that he might really become to the london of his own day what to imperial neronian rome the author of the satyricon once had been yet in his inmost heart he desired to be something more than a mere arbiter elegantiarum to be consulted on the wearing of a jewel or the knotting of a necktie or the conduct of a cane he sought to elaborate some new scheme of life that would have its reasoned philosophy and its ordered principles and find in the spiritualizing of the senses its highest realization the worship of the senses has often and with much justice been decried 
men feeling a natural instinct of terror about passions and sensations that seem stronger than themselves and that they are conscious of sharing with the less highly organized forms of existence but it appeared to dorian gray that the true nature of the senses had never been understood and that they had remained savage and animal merely because the world had tried to starve them into submission or to kill them by pain instead of aiming at making them elements of a new spirituality of which a fine instinct for beauty was to be the dominant characteristic as he looked back upon man moving through history he was haunted by a feeling of loss so much had been surrendered and to such little purpose there had been mad wilful rejections monstrous forms of self-torture and self-denial whose origin was fear and whose result was a degradation infinitely more terrible than that fancied degradation from which in their ignorance they had sought to escape nature in her wonderful irony driving out the anchorite to feed with the wild animals of the desert and giving to the hermit the beasts of the field as his companions yes there was to be as lord henry had prophesied a new hedonism that was to recreate life and to save it from that harsh uncomely puritanism that is having in our own day its curious revival it was to have its service of the intellect certainly yet it was never to accept any theory or system that would involve the sacrifice of any mode of passionate experience its aim indeed was to be experience itself and not the fruits of experience sweet or bitter as they might be of the asceticism that deadens the senses as of the vulgar profligacy that dulls them it was to know nothing but it was to teach man to concentrate himself upon the moments of a life that is itself but a moment there are few of us who have not sometimes wakened before dawn either after one of those dreamless nights that make us almost enamoured of death or one of those nights of horror and misshapen joy when through the chambers of the brain sweep phantoms more terrible than reality itself and instinct with that vivid life that lurks in all grotesques and that lends to gothic art its enduring vitality this art being one might fancy especially the art of those whose minds have been troubled with the malady of reverie gradually white fingers creep through the curtains and they appear to tremble in black fantastic shapes dumb shadows crawl into the corners of the room and crouch there outside there is the stirring of birds among the leaves or the sound of men going forth to their work or the sigh and sob of the wind coming down from the hills and wandering round the silent house as though it feared to wake the sleepers and yet must needs call forth sleep from her purple cave veil after veil of thin dusky gauze is lifted and by degrees the forms and colours of things are restored to them and we watch the dawn remaking the world in its antique pattern the wan mirrors get back their mimic life the flameless tapers stand where we had left them and beside them lies the half-cut book that we had been studying or the wired flower that we had worn at the ball or the letter that we had been afraid to read or that we had read too often nothing seems to us changed out of the unreal shadows of the night comes back the real life that we had known we have to resume it where we had left off 
and there steals over us a terrible sense of the necessity for the continuance of energy in the same wearisome round of stereotyped habits or a wild longing it may be that our eyelids might open some morning upon a world that had been refashioned anew in the darkness for our pleasure a world in which things would have fresh shapes and colours and be changed or have other secrets a world in which the past would have little or no place or survive at any rate in no conscious form of obligation or regret the remembrance even of joy having its bitterness and the memories of pleasure their pain it was the creation of such worlds as these that seemed to dorian gray to be the true object or amongst the true objects of life and in his search for sensations that would be at once new and delightful and possess that element of strangeness that is so essential to romance he would often adopt certain modes of thought that he knew to be really alien to his nature abandon himself to their subtle influences and then having as it were caught their colour and satisfied his intellectual curiosity leave them with that curious indifference that is not incompatible with a real ardour of temperament and that indeed according to certain modern psychologists is often a condition of it it was rumoured of him once that he was about to join the roman catholic communion and certainly the roman ritual had always a great attraction for him the daily sacrifice more awful really than all the sacrifices of the antique world stirred him as much by its superb rejection of the evidence of the senses as by the primitive simplicity of its elements and the eternal pathos of the human tragedy that it sought to symbolise he loved to kneel down on the cold marble pavement and watch the priest in his stiff flowered dalmatic slowly and with white hands moving aside the veil of the tabernacle or raising aloft the jewelled lantern-shaped monstrance with that pallid wafer that at times one would fain think is indeed the panis celestis the bread of angels or robed in the garments of the passion of christ breaking the host into the chalice and smiting his breast for his sins the fuming censers that the grave boys in their lace and scarlet tossed into the air like great gilt flowers had their subtle fascination for him as he passed out he used to look with wonder at the black confessionals and long to sit in the dim shadow of one of them and listen to men and women whispering through the worn grating the true story of their lives but he never fell into the error of arresting his intellectual development by any formal acceptance of creed or system or of mistaking for a house in which to live an inn that is but suitable for the sojourn of a night or for a few hours of a night in which there are no stars and the moon is in travail mysticism with its marvellous power of making common things strange to us and the subtle antinomianism that always seems to accompany it moved him for a season and for a season he inclined to the materialistic doctrines of the darwinismus movement in germany and found a curious pleasure in tracing the thoughts and passions of men to some pearly cell in the brain or some white nerve in the body delighting in the conception of the absolute dependence of the spirit on certain physical conditions morbid or healthy normal or diseased yet as has been said of him before no theory of life seemed to him to be of any importance compared with life itself 
he felt keenly conscious of how barren all intellectual speculation is when separated from action and experiment he knew that the senses no less than the soul have their spiritual mysteries to reveal and so he would now study perfumes and the secrets of their manufacture distilling heavily scented oils and burning odorous gums from the east he saw that there was no mood of the mind that had not its counterpart in the sensuous life and set himself to discover their true relations wondering what there was in frankincense that made one mystical and in ambergris that stirred one's passions and in violets that woke the memory of dead romances and in musk that troubled the brain and in champak that stained the imagination and seeking often to elaborate a real psychology of perfumes and to estimate the several influences of sweet-smelling roots and scented pollen-laden flowers of aromatic balms and of dark and fragrant woods of spikenard that sickens of hovenia that makes men mad and of aloes that are said to be able to expel melancholy from the soul at another time he devoted himself entirely to music and in a long latticed room with a vermilion and gold ceiling and walls of olive green lacquer he used to give curious concerts in which mad gypsies tore wild music from little zithers or grave yellow shawled tunisians plucked at the strained strings of monstrous lutes while grinning negroes beat monotonously upon copper drums and crouching upon scarlet mats slim turbaned indians blew through long pipes of reed or brass and charmed or feigned to charm great hooded snakes and horrible horned adders the harsh intervals and shrill discords of barbaric music stirred him at times when schubert's grace and chopin's beautiful sorrows and the mighty harmonies of beethoven himself fell unheeded on his ear he collected together from all parts of the world the strangest instruments that could be found either in the tombs of dead nations or among the few savage tribes that have survived contact with western civilizations and loved to touch and try them he had the mysterious juru paris of the rio negro indians that women are not allowed to look at and that even youths may not see till they have been subjected to fasting and scourging and the earthen jars of the peruvians that have the shrill cries of birds and flutes of human bones such as alfonso de ovalle heard in chile and the sonorous green jaspers that are found near cusco and give forth a note of singular sweetness he had painted gourds filled with pebbles that rattled when they were shaken the long clarin of the mexicans into which the performer does not blow but through which he inhales the air the harsh dure of the amazon tribes that is sounded by the sentinels who sit all day long in high trees and can be heard it is said at a distance of three leagues the teponastli that has two vibrating tongues of wood and is beaten with sticks that are smeared with an elastic gum obtained from the milky juice of plants the yotl bells of the aztecs that are hung in clusters like grapes and a huge cylindrical drum covered with the skins of great serpents like the one that bernal diaz saw when he went with cortes into the mexican temple and of whose doleful sound he has left us so vivid a description the fantastic character of these instruments fascinated him 
and he felt a curious delight in the thought that art like nature has her monsters things of bestial shape and with hideous voices yet after some time he wearied of them and would sit in his box at the opera either alone or with lord henry listening in rapt pleasure to tannhauser and seeing in the prelude to that great work of art a presentation of the tragedy of his own soul on one occasion he took up the study of jewels and appeared at a costume ball as anne de joyeuse admiral of france in a dress covered with five hundred and sixty pearls this taste enthralled him for years and indeed may be said never to have left him he would often spend a whole day settling and resettling in their cases the various stones that he had collected such as the olive-green chrysoberyl that turns red by lamplight the cymophane with its wire-like line of silver the pistachio-coloured perido rose-pink and wine-yellow topazes carbuncles of fiery scarlet with tremulous four-rayed stars flame-red cinnamon stones orange and violet spinels and amethysts with their alternate layers of ruby and sapphire he loved the red gold of the sunstone and the moonstone's pearly whiteness and the broken rainbow of the milky opal he procured from amsterdam three emeralds of extraordinary size and richness of colour and had a turquoise de la vieille roche that was the envy of all the connoisseurs he discovered wonderful stories also about jewels in alfonso's clericalis disciplina a serpent was mentioned with eyes of real jacinth and in the romantic history of alexander the conqueror of emathia was said to have found in the vale of jordan snakes with collars of real emeralds growing on their backs there was a gem in the brain of the dragon philostratus told us and by the exhibition of golden letters and a scarlet robe the monster could be thrown into a magical sleep and slain according to the great alchemist pierre de boniface the diamond rendered a man invisible and the agate of india made him eloquent the cornelian appeased anger and the hyacinth provoked sleep and the amethyst drove away the fumes of wine the garnet cast out demons and the hydropicus deprived the moon of her colour the selenite waxed and waned with the moon and the melosius that discovers thieves could be affected only by the blood of kids leonardus camillus had seen a white stone taken from the brain of a newly killed toad that was a certain antidote against poison the bezoar that was found in the heart of the arabian deer was a charm that could cure the plague in the nests of arabian birds was the aspilates that according to democritus kept the wearer from any danger by fire the king of ceylon rode through his city with a large ruby in his hand at the ceremony of his coronation the gates of the palace of john the priest were made of sardius with the horn of the horned snake inwrought so that no man might bring poison within over the gable were two golden apples in which were two carbuncles so that the gold might shine by day and the carbuncles by night in lodge's strange romance a marguerite of america it was stated that in the chamber of the queen one could behold all the chaste ladies of the world enchased out of silver looking through fair mirrors of chrysolites carbuncles sapphires and green emeralds 
marco polo had seen the inhabitants of zipangu place rose-coloured pearls in the mouths of the dead a sea monster had been enamoured of the pearl that the diver brought to king perozes and had slain the thief and mourned for seven moons over its loss when the huns lured the king into the great pit he flung it away procopius tells the story nor was it ever found again though the emperor anastasius offered five hundred weight of gold pieces for it the king of malabar had shown to a certain venetian a rosary of three hundred and four pearls one for every god that he worshipped when the duc de valentinois son of alexander the sixth visited louis the twelfth of france his horse was loaded with gold leaves according to brantome and his cap had double rows of rubies that threw out a great light charles of england had ridden in stirrups hung with four hundred and twenty-one diamonds richard the second had a coat valued at thirty thousand marks which was covered with ballas rubies hall described henry the eighth on his way to the tower previous to his coronation as wearing a jacket of raised gold the placard embroidered with diamonds and other rich stones and a great borderick about his neck of large ballaces the favourites of james i wore earrings of emeralds set in gold filigrane edward the second gave to piers gaveston a suit of red gold armour studded with jacinths a collar of gold roses set with turquoise stones and a skull-cap parsemé with pearls henry the second wore jewelled gloves reaching to the elbow and had a hawk-glove sewn with twelve rubies and fifty-two great orients the ducal hat of charles the rash the last duke of burgundy of his race was hung with pear-shaped pearls and studded with sapphires how exquisite life had once been how gorgeous in its pomp and decoration even to read of the luxury of the dead was wonderful End of chapter 11, part 1